Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the New Books in Japanese Studies, a channel on the New Books Network. I'm Takeshi Morisato. Today, I'll be talking to Matthew Carl Strecker, who is the author of The Forbidden Worlds of Haruki Murakami, a book that was published in 2014 by University of Minnesota Press. Hello, Matthew. Hello. It's nice to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we are very much excited to talk to you about your book on Haruki Murakami, uh, because when we you know, mention his name at any conference receptions or dinner party with friends who love literature, uh, we can expect that there will be a series of heated discussions, <laughs> and especially um, about his work, not only about the content of his work, but also receptions. Um, but before getting into Murakami's worlds, I would like to start with questions about you. Uh, could you introduce yourself by telling telling us about your career, research, and how you were involved with this field of Japanese literature? Uh, that could take the entire interview, but I'll try and keep it short. Um, <laughs> okay. I, actually, what, what sort of, I hate to ask this, but what kinds of things do you really want to know? <laughs> um, so maybe how you end up, I guess, the um, you know this field of Japanese literature. Um, you know, where you study and how you enter this um, field. Um, oh, got it. And also, perhaps you could tell us, like, how you end up working on Haruki Murakami among the, um, you know, entire history of Japanese literature. Okay, yeah, that, that certainly makes sense. That way I won't bore you, you or your listeners. Um, I, I suppose the No, short- no, no, this is very interesting. This is the only, yeah, well, this is the part that listeners really love oh, to get to know the author. So please take your time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, it's not a very long story. I got started uh, as an undergraduate planning to be in the field of English literature. And so I spent most of my undergraduate years reading uh, the, the great English texts. And I got into French literature, Russian literature, most of it 19th century, and I was studying Japanese on the side because from the time I was a fairly young kid, for some reason, I was interested in Japan. Nobody can quite figure out why that happened. And so throughout the period, I was also reading Japanese literature on my own. I was at the University of Texas, which had a very small Japanese program. I think there were probably 30 students in the program at the time, and I I think we may have had Japanese literature taught, but I'm honestly not sure. I never heard about those courses. And uh, our professor, the person who ran the program, passed away in my sophomore year, so I never got to know him. And the bottom line is I was self-taught until I finished my degree. And then uh, two things happened. One, I found myself interested in Japanese studies and two, my father, who was a dean at the time at the time at another university, told me that uh, for every P- every job opening in English literature, there were some three hundred hungry PhDs in English literature looking for work. And so <laughs> the ratio wasn't see, yeah. promising. And he said, "Why don't you try a different literature? Because you'll never. It's no matter how good you are, it's going to be hard to get work." So I switched to Japanese literature in my master's program, and that was uh, the best decision I ever made. And so at Texas, I was studying with Susan Napier and um, Carolyn Haynes in classical literature, a guy named Xian Yen, who did uh, linguistics and comparative studies. And it was great. I I translated Soseki's uh, Chinese poetry for my MA thesis. And um, when it came time to go on to the Ph.D., we didn't have that at Texas. So I applied at some schools, uh, Washington among them, and I was fortunate to be accepted at Washington. And I think when I got there, just to kind of bring it up to date, one of the things that I realized was that I wanted to get as far away from the Meiji and Taisho periods as I could uh, in terms of just time. I wanted to move into later works. And so I happened to meet Jay Rubin my first semester. This was autumn of 1991 at Washington and Seattle. And uh, Jay 
in the course of one of his seminars, he handed us all a copy of、uh, Murakami's short story, Bimbo na Obasan no Hanashi. <coughs> Excuse me. And,、uh, and I was just absolutely knocked over by it. In, I couldn't believe that a Japanese writer had written something like this. And so I got very excited. I think others in the class may have enjoyed it, but I don't think anyone went quite as crazy about this story as I did. And at some point, I was reading more and more. And Jay said, Why don't you think about doing your dissertation on him? And I said, Sure. And so the following year, he actually invited Murakami to join our,、uh, our seminar. I think this was the autumn of 92. And I had a chance to sit down with Murakami over some beer and have a long talk. And、uh, we, I, I really liked both him and his work. So it was a good idea to. Work on him. It also seemed like he was a guy who was going to go someplace, but no one could predict what was really going to happen in 92. So it was a lucky.、Mm-hmm. lucky That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Very yeah. lucky choice. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah. So,、um, so you've been following his work since、uh, um, early 90s. And, yeah, from、um, 91. That's right. Also, yeah. Yeah, that is incredible to actually work with him and also Jay Rubin at the same time in, in, in the same、um, room, I, w- I would say, because of the you know, big names in the, in the field of Japanese literature. But perhaps、um, I, I can follow up on these questions. But the, so, can you tell us how the origin of this book, so how this book came to be? So, from meeting Murakami working on dissertation to、uh, this latest book on. Um, metaphysical worlds of Haruki Murakami. How did you reach this stage where you started to talk about this issue?、Uh, once again, there are some, some long stories and some short versions. So maybe I can kind of give the roughly short version. Well, as, as I think you know, because you originally approached me about a book called Dances with Sheep,、uh, I, that was my first book. That was actually originally my dissertation, and it got rewritten nine times into this. Uh, into this tome that、uh, actually,、uh, and, and if you've read that book, you probably know that it,、uh, it really deals with these sorts of metaphysical eruptions, you might say, from the other world. That's what really got me interested in Murakami to start with this、uh, the poor ant, you know, from a poor ant story. What was she? What, where did she come from? And what was her function? And so, really, Dances with Sheep was about telling that story. And trying to get some sense of why it happens and what are some of the、uh, theoretical bases for such eruptions into the real world. And at the time I was writing Dances with Sheep, I think this must have been around 1998 now,、uh, three years after I graduated from Washington, I had the manuscript ready and I sent it off to Michigan for review. And、uh, they sent it out to some referees, of course, as they do. And it was accepted, but one of the referees said something that really stuck with me, and I can't quote it word for word, but he or she said, I know who you are, I know your work, I'm familiar with you, and you talk a lot about these,、uh, you know, some of this really deep, dark metaphysical stuff、uh, dealing with the other world. It's interesting, but if you publish it now, you're too young, too early in your career. To come across like this much of a crackpot. And th- those weren't the exact words, but was, <laughs> you're going to sound a little. Yeah, right. Yeah. Paraphrase it. If you put this in your first book, people are going to think you're a little nutty. So why not save it for a later book, tone it down, and publish what you've got, and do this one later? And so Forbidden Worlds is actually the result of that piece of advice, which,、uh, I mean, it just. It, it was a book I always wanted to write. It was a topic I always wanted to dig more into. And I got to say, I'm grateful to the referee because I was not ready in 1998 to write this kind of a book. I just didn't have the experience or maybe even, maybe not the life experience and certainly not the writing. Yeah.、Book. So. And also, probably, like the, in terms of materials、um, that are available at the time and at the timing in which you started to write this book,、um, probably the contours of the, you know, the metaphysical worlds would be quite different、um, if you wrote in the late 90s, I wonder. 
That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, I think mm-hmm. the latest major novel, uh, I'm, I'm kind of counting out Kokyo no Minami Taiyo no Nishi that I think, if I've got the dates right, that, was that the one that came out around 97 or 98? I may be thinking of a different one. In any case, maybe it was Sputnik Sweetheart. Any, anyhow, the latest really serious book that had come out by that time was Neji Makidori, which was admittedly the beginning of Murakami uh, writing about a kind of shared metaphysical space as opposed to a personal one. And so I could have done that, but I, having seen it only in that one novel, I don't think I was ready to understand what I was seeing yet. So it really helped me see some of the later works and get a sense of where he was going with that. Because it was obviously it's a, it's a motif that really blooms in the later works that it hadn't, in a way, it hadn't done before Neji Makidori. So. Yeah. So um, I think the, my next question would be something like the, um, you know, the biography, uh, bibliography of uh, Haruki Murakami. And this is a question that we need to always kind of, you know, put on the side so that we can move on to the content of his novels. But this is the question about the, um, you know, the, his reception of his work. Uh, in general, into the general public. And, you know, I think at this point, it's almost cliche to ask whether or not Murakami will win the Nobel Prize in literature. But I would like to ask a few questions based on this issue of when. Um, So the first question is, why does it take so long for his works to be appreciated by the juries or important literary figures? I mean, he basically won every conceivable literary prize in Japan and many other international ones. But, you know, and also he's probably the most translated among Japanese writers, too. But somehow I feel the reception of his works among some, you know, higher critics is not as always a slam dunk case uh, as other writers. Um, do you have any any response to that sort of why Murakami is not winning um, the, the Nobel Prize in literature? <laughs> well, I'm not sure I could tell you why he hasn't won the Nobel Prize yet. I, I can tell you this. Um... The, he has won most of the major literary prizes in Japan, but the one he didn't win was the Akutagawa. And this is the one that, I mean, this is literally the big fish that got away. I, you know, we kind of understand here that when you win the Akutagawa, you are marked as a serious, important writer or potentially so. And, and I'm not saying everybody that wins the Akutagawa becomes a great writer because some of them do not. But it's a mark of approval by the, the literary establishment. And Murakami started, in a sense, on the wrong foot with the literary establishment. And I think he kind of meant to do that. I mean, if you read his, uh, his little memoir of, of essays, um, Shokugyo Toshite no Shosetsuka, uh, what's, I don't know what the English title of that is. I suppose the professional writer, um, the novelist as professional writer, maybe. In any case, he, uh, he talks about how he began his writing career and he tried to write something that looked like Jumbungaku, you know, serious, pure literature. And it was awful in his own estimation. He says he burned the manuscript, which is, uh, I, I'd love to have that manuscript right now, just to see what he considered a dreadful piece of writing. And then he decided he was going to do something entirely irrespective of what the literary community thinks is good. And that's what became Kaze no Uta o Kike, you know, Hear the Wind Sing. And so once, once he had that out, uh, you know, the, the, the critics were split on the decision that the Gunzo Prize, uh, you know, the Shinjin Show Prize uh, Committee, they, uh, some of them loved it. Some of them said it was too American style. But I think everybody was jarred, either in a good way or a bad way, by the sort of undecorated style that Murakami was putting forth as his writing style. And he himself sort of came out fairly early, I remember he said this to me too, about being not about literature, and not a, but being about fiction. And he didn't want to see himself as a a literary figure so much as a storyteller. And I I thought that was significant. When we were first talking back in the early 90s, he actually preferred that I use fiction rather than literature when I talked about his work. And and I think I understood that. He did not want to be grouped together with 
people who produce literature, who produce stories as art. He never wanted to be perceived as an artist in those days. I don't, I can't speak for today, but he made it fairly clear that's not what he wanted. And so having started in that direction, this was a sort of way of telling the literary establishment he didn't really need them. And I think it was also just, I, I mean, I, you'd have to ask him this, but based on what I read in Shokugyo Toshite no Shosetsuka, I would say that this was maybe also his response to not winning the Akutagawa Prize. They don't need me. I don't need them either. And so there's been this sort of, I, I don't want to call it a tension, because some of the tension has eased a great deal, especially with, uh, uh, what was the one, goodness, Sekai no Wari to How to Boy to Wandarando. I think that was the one that Oi Kenzaburo really liked and admired, and 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 so he, in a sense, Murakami won Oi's approval for that novel, if not for his other things. And slowly, some of the other writers have come along and said, yeah, he is something important. Some of the critics will never warm up to him. And I think it has to do with a, uh, a fairly specific idea of what literature is supposed to do in the post-war sy- social system we have in Japan. Uh, and just to put that very briefly, I'd say in the post-war, a writer's task was to be a public intellectual, to be a, an intellectual leader and spokesperson for society and not just to write for himself or herself. Storytellers were also supposed to be people who had serious ideas about serious issues. And these critics who came up around that time really cut their teeth in the the critical world, looking at writers who did that. And so Murakami broke that mold. He broke the, the, uh, the model a little bit. And some of the critics... I'm, I'm thinking, for instance, of Kuroko Kazuo, who uh, I got to know in the 90s and, and I admire very much, but he never really quite was comfortable with Murakami's political approach or his political stance. And uh, he, Murakami wasn't explicitly political enough for him, I think. That's how I read him. And, and I understand where he's coming from. Murakami is nothing like the writers who spent their days writing about the social problems that afflict Japan in a very open and obvious way. He tended to write his political critique under the surface and so much so in the beginning that it was almost indiscernible. But then I think about someone like Kato Norihiro, another, uh, I I miss him, uh, rest his soul, but uh, uh, Professor Kato actually had similar critiques at times, but he found something there that still was living up to the spirit of the political writer. And I think that was that was important to some of the critics who came around to Murakami or were with him from the beginning. Others were not. But I think that's part of he, He's had very mixed responses here, and I think he'll continue to have them because some people will never forget how he started or we'll never see what he's doing as what a writer should do in proper Japanese literary established circles. And I understand that. I can see where they're coming. Yeah. Okay. I think I have a couple follow-up questions in, in later parts, and especially his involvement with this imagery of social activism. Uh, you know, the, the uh, maybe perhaps we can jump on that. The question, uh, the lecture that he provided in... Um, Jerusalem that you mentioned in the book that, I mean, it's a timely, timely topic uh, in, in, in a way that, um, you know, each indiv- single individual is like the eggshell. Then all, all we can do is just sort of throw that eggshell against this massive wall. Um, That's a great metaphor. So there is in a way, you know, there's in a way there's a symbolism of resistance that is, um, you know, really observant of what's actually going on in a society. And it's not, it might not be normative criticism, but at the same time, it seems to give this descriptive um, force. Sure. You know, about what's going on. Do do you think um, that element of the social um, activism or a kind of a social critique as fiction writer, like sort of survived throughout the, his works or just sort of like, only occasionally pops up or hardly ever shows up at the surface of his text. 
I think it's always been there, but not in the form of the wall and the egg. That's that's an interesting metaphor that I think a lot of us have been much intrigued by. But if you look at his literature, really from particularly the third book onward, so we're talking about Hitsuji uh, Omeguro uh, Boken, A Wild Sheep Chase, you're looking at lone wolf characters, these these you know lonely, detached people who find themselves uh, unexpectedly caught up in much larger events. And I think one of the reasons that this was not always recognized as political critique is that the story itself was so bizarrely metaphysical, uh, almost, almost fantasy. I mean, who on earth writes social or political critique about a magic sheep? It's almost absurd. And uh, at the same time, Murakami is as much as anything, an allegorist. He loves to write allegory. And and his, his political allegories, unfortunately, sometimes pass unnoticed, uh, or they're so open, so widely open, that nobody can decide what exactly they're about. Uh, just as one example, Hitsuji, uh, different critics have had radically different readings for what the sheep and the whole structure of this novel is about, uh, some like Kato Norihiro put a very specific face on it. You know, the sheep or uh, represents this, or the boss, the sensei character represents this guy in history. And others are looking at it and saying, no, this is a critique of the collapse of the student movement. And people like me are reading it and saying, this is all about an overbearing uh, social system uh, based on the Kandi Shakai model, you know, the, the managed society. And individual struggles to resist it. It is a socio-political critique, but because it's based on or built on rather an open symbol, that being a sheep that never actually appears in the novel, it's darn difficult to pin that down. And so having said that, this is a story about a lone person who's basically helpless, trying to pit himself against all the powers in the universe that are running Japan. And uh, that is the classic egg hurling itself against the wall. Now, most people would just say, it's too much for me. I can't stop these guys. There's nothing I can do. I will just do what I'm told. He finds he's, he doesn't play a suicidal game of just, you know, saying, I can't take this. I'm going to jump off a bridge. He actually plays along, but he plays along on his terms and in the end, he survives, but he doesn't really win exactly. I mean, he, he beats the individual face of the of the machine or, or of the, uh, the organization, but we know the organization is still out there. And even though the sheep dies with Nezumi at the end, we don't know if the sheep is really dead. Uh, Nezumi is dead. And the sheep is no, you know. Nezumi says the sheep died with me. Do we know that? Because does power ever really disappear in in any society, uh, especially industrialized societies? I don't think so. So this runs through. We see the same thing in Neji Makidori and Wind Up Bird Chronicle, uh, sort of embodied in the power of uh, initially Boris the man skinner, this sadistic maniac who likes to skin people to death. Um, and, of course, we notice that uh, Lieutenant Mamiya attempts to kill him uh, at point-blank range. She fires a pistol at Boris and misses both times. And Boris's response is, you know, you can't kill me. You're, you're not qualified to kill me. Now, what in the world could that possibly mean? I'm thinking it means that Lieutenant Mamiya is one of the little people, the nobodies, and they don't get to kill the powerful but when the whole scene is reenacted, uh, you know, 50 years later in, uh, in the contemporary part of Wind Up Bird Chronicle, we see that uh, Okada Toru confronts Wataya Noboru, who is sort of the modern reincarnation of Boris, uh, a sadistic political beast. And uh, by encountering him in what I call the metaphysical realm, he he actually evens the odds. He, he gains access to Wataya Noboru and he beats him uh, senseless with a baseball bat. So that's, that's a case where I would say the egg, I, I almost want to say the egg knocks down the wall, but to put it really more correctly, because 
the metaphysical world sort of erases the differences between things that, you know, we're going to talk about this later, I'm sure, but the metaphysical realm is a place where these kinds of binaries of the powerful and the powerless are, are sort of uh, disrupted or even, even eliminated. <clears throat> this is a chance where the egg becomes made of concrete like the wall and the wall turns into something made of eggshell. So mm -hmm. this, right. uh, this it's a, a transformative uh, interaction. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So, so yeah. In that way, uh, Okada Toru just once succeeds in being the egg that brings down the wall. But we all know the mm -hmm. wall doesn't disappear forever. He takes down his personal yeah. wall, but there's always another wall. Mm -hmm. so. It's interesting how the, the weapons of the choice, it's actually a baseball bat, because uh, I remember from your book that Haruki Murakami decided to become a novelist after watching a baseball game or something like that, right? That it wasn't a Jingu Kyujo, uh, uh, yes, well, so this baseball bat is involved in this uh, um conquest uh, before this jumping into this sort of binary of um, a metaphysical world I just wanted to ask you one quick question because this is a question that a lot of listeners actually ask me beforehand uh, is a recent article on Haruki Murakami uh, okay. LA Times article on Murakami you know the how he fell in, in into a literally well um, I think I already know what your response is, and I think what you have been describing is, you know, really the response to that's not how the literally well in Murakami works. Uh, but can you give us a little word about what you think about this sort of um, uh, contemporary reception of Haruki Murakami as depicted in uh, LA Times review? Sure. Yeah. You know, I read that review and <clears throat> I have to say, I, I I mean, Haruki might get really upset with me for this, but I was sympathetic to the review. And um, I, it's, it's very tricky because Murakami started his career really by doing things that nobody else was doing. And, and it was very exciting. He was, he was the rebel, and uh, people read him because they loved the rebellion in him. And I, I forget who said this, but somebody pointed out he's had really three distinct readerships. He had the, the former student radicals at the beginning. And then from Norway no Mori, he had a different crowd of people that kind of liked the sort of romantic side. And then after Neji Makidori, he had a whole new readership build up. And these were the people that were getting into the whole magic thing. And and some of, uh, I'm not actually sure what they were turning on to. I have some theories. But the point is, he started out at, I mean, his early career really progresses through a series of, I won't call them quite tenkan. I don't want to go as far as saying a transformation of his very essence as a writer, but he tried different things. And I think that was really key to his success. He was always trying something new because he was developing from a beginning writer into a professional, you know, solid experienced uh, writer. And he got better with every book, I think until at some point, I think he began, uh, I think two things happened. One is that it became a little bit harder to keep experimenting with new things. And I think anyone who's gotten very successful at what he's doing is probably going to have a certain resistance to making radical changes now uh, and stepping away from the path that has brought him where he is. And so I think he's still trying to maintain some of that magic that he was fa so famous for early in his career. Uh, and at the same time, he's kind of being pushed by the readership itself and maybe by the demands of just modern publishing to produce almost in a modernist uh, impulse to produce newer and more innovative things all the time. And, and I'm not sure whether he entirely embraces that. I haven't talked to him in a long time and Frankly, I don't like to go to the author too much for my answers anyway. I prefer to look at the texts. But my is he's always kind of res resisted the modernist impulse to be innovative every time, uh, to make everything new and different. And so what we're seeing as a result is maybe some short stories where he's getting a little more introspective, but he's also a little less eager, I think, to experiment with the wild stuff. And... 
I'll, I'll say this about short stories because in, in some way it, it's very difficult to write a review of one of his short story collections. And that because at least speaking personally, I've always thought his short stories were primarily uh, for the purpose of experimenting with new ideas. And this is why you see so many elements of his short stories bearing fruit in the novels and they work much better. And so Early on, when he was doing a lot of the wild, magical things, his short stories were equally wild. I think of uh, Odoru Kobito, you know, the dancing dwarf, it's called in English. And that was one of the most profoundly interesting uh, re, sort of reconstructions of a fairy tale structure style that I've ever seen. And it was fun, and my grad students loved it. But he's been kind of moving away from that, other than the story about the... Uh, the Shinagawa Zaru, you know, the Shinagawa monkey, where he's still playing with some fairly magical elements. I I kind of understand where the reviewer is coming from. At the same time, I think it I, I'm hesitant to overly critique his short stories because they are in general experimental and they usually point us to where he's gonna go with the next big long fiction. But I, I gotta be honest, I wasn't that crazy about uh this this new collection either mm, it was it wasn't very um it shouldn't be treated as the publication of the new novel or something like that it was the collection of experiment experimental writings um so the perhaps that's the um disappointment from uh you know someone who's been reading the longer novels and read this collection of short stories. Yeah, I think it might be. And I have to say also, I didn't quite agree with the reviewer in uh, her remarks about uh, Ichikyu Hachion, 1Q84, or uh, Kishidan Chogoroshi, uh, Killing Commendatore. I thought both were interesting and had plenty of good things to say. And I actually really liked uh, Colorless Tazaki Tsukuru. Uh, Didn't, like any of these novels at first and then as i when i reread them i found them quite fascinating but i think it also helps that i i read the originals i don't read translations if i can help it and there's a good reason for that, that i'll explain if pressed but uh <clears throat> i i just i try to i generally avoid the translations if i can help it <laughs> yeah i think i have one questions about the translation um <laughs> You know, I the, that one, maybe I can jump on that just to take advantage of this. Uh, you can. Uh, I mean, your book mentions that there are several different translations of Haruki Murakami. And mm-hmm. as I mentioned, his books has been translated many times. And it seems, you know, there's an element of translatable. That is to say, if you translate Haruki Murakami from Japanese to English, it's a lot easier than some other uh, writers, let's okay. say. Um but do you feel there are like the differences of the translation are so widely different that um, you prefer to translate yourself, uh, or do you have any um, favorite translator that I really like this translation rather than this one? Okay, no, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I I love the translations that are produced. I do. I think they're excellent. They are different. I think if you compare Alfred Birnbaum's work on the early stuff. Uh, to Jay Rubens, you see some radical differences. Uh, Birnbaum is certainly much more um, creative. Uh, if I put it this way, I hope Jay doesn't get mad, but he, he's more creative in sort of inventing the style of Murakami. And, and in a sense, he over, overdid it, but in a fairly uh, effective way, so that he sort of established Murakami as a hard-boiled sounding writer. Uh, in a way, that Haruki doesn't sound that way in Japanese, but it worked to draw readers in, and so it was very effective, and I liked it. Uh, I, I'd say Jay is um, it, Jay is immensely accurate, and he's got a beautiful writing style. He's probably, I would say, he's probably the closest to producing what it really sounds like in Japanese. Uh, and uh, here, here's where I'm going to try and get on Jay's good side again. Jay doesn't make mistakes. Uh, I remember that from graduate seminars because I did, and uh, he doesn't. So that was a bad economy for us. Uh, he always noticed my mistakes, and 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 I was always a little bit intimidated by his perfection. 
there. Now I'm on Jay's good side. Uh, he's gonna, <laughs> he's going to send me a letter for this. <laughs> Thank uh, you so much for saying this. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'm yeah. in trouble now. Yeah. And and Phil Gabriel is one of the others. Ted Goosen as well. They're all excellent translators. They all they're accurate. They're on the ball. I have no complaints. The reason I don't use the translations when I write about Haruki is that I really want to work with the original text in its immediacy. And I don't want to put up a layer of interpretation between me and, and, and what I have to say about it. And so that means, I mean, in some cases, I actually now have started using some of the translated uh, texts in my articles, usually at the request of the publisher. And I know it makes it easier for the readers. And it, it, I do want to show respect to the translators. But for me, so much of what's important in this text uh, needs to be read unfiltered and unmediated through my own interpretive reading strategies of the original. And that's why I tend to stick to that. And I tend to use my own translations, partly for that and partly because I like to match those with the style of my book or, you know, my own style. Uh, and so I, it, it just, for me, it made more sense but I can understand why it could be a problem for some folks. I, I'm not mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. Was that all of that question or was there more? I'm, I feel like. No, I'm, this is, uh, this is exactly oh, the uh, answer we wanted. So, there there um, was one other point I have to make though. And this is really one of the reasons I don't read the translations. If I can help it, it's because I've always found that one of the most important charms of reading Murakami for me is the language itself which is strange to say after you describe his, after I've been describing this sort of undecorated plain style that he uses, but there is a subtle charm in the language that kind of knocks me over. It's especially evident in the first two books and particularly the very first one, Hear the Wind Sing, because there's really no story going on there to speak of. It's not much of a plot. And so really the reason readers still uh, of a certain age want to read this book and kind of feel its atmosphere is because of the language. And so if you read it in translation, I think you would probably get to the end and say, "What? Was, why did I do this? And, <laughs> right. I mean, I got to say, Ted Goosen's translation is brilliant. And Alfred Birnbaum did a translation of it early on that was brilliant. And uh, they're, they're right on the mark. They haven't made mistakes. It's nothing like that. Very accurate stuff. It's just that you cannot translate music. Uh, uh, you can try. You can put in your own music, which is sort of what they've tried to do. But I don't think you get the music that I find the most charming in these texts. And that's why I still read them for pleasure, but only in the originals. So that's I see. So the, Yeah. So the li- li- lyrical side of the Murakami's writing is sometimes very difficult to translate and um um so the, 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 that that's the one of the reasons why you prefer to read in original yeah um, it's a rhythm thank it's you so a, much yeah it's a rhythm mm-hmm. it, it's almost like listening to a, a good jazz rhythm rhythm it just mm-hmm. it kind of the beat gets going in you and you can you can feel it and kind of move with it uh i, I mm-hmm. that's a stupid way to put it but it's the best i can manage no it's beautifully put um so perhaps we can you know go from the uh, surface of the text into this metaphysical realm, uh, which is the central theme of your book. And um, uh, I have many, many questions. Um, you know, the, maybe the first questions that I would have is this image that you uh, provided in fairly in the beginning of the book, in an introduction, you provided this image of the house. So the, you know, four story, well, two story house with the two basements and the top floor Second floor is private space, and first floor is public space and collective narrative. And then B1 is the dream memories, and B2 is the core identity narrative. Um, I guess my question is why uh, this, this form? Uh, how, how did you arrive at this um, picture? Well, it, it's, I can't really claim that it's an original idea. This, uh, of course, Murakami talks about this. This is... I think this uh, this image appears right after the uh, the long quote that he gives in a long, an interview he gave about Kafka on the shore. But the reason it really struck me is that it's almost identical 
to uh, the story that Carl Jung tells of a dream he had in which he was in a four floor uh, structure. And he doesn't actually go in uh, for Jung. It's not a second floor, first floor structure, but it was four levels that seemed to go from uh, consciousness to uh, pre-consciousness to unconscious to collective unconscious. And um, he doesn't precisely use those terms. He talks about different, uh, I think, phases of consciousness or something like this. So it, it, the metaphor just seemed to work because I had been kind of playing around with that idea myself. Really, I just wanted a, a visual way of imagining the way, the, the way that consciousness, uh, wakefulness, uh, contrasts with something like uh, the sub or pre-conscious the, as, as a realm that we can, or as a mode of consciousness, we can access when we're awake or when we're asleep. And of course, the personal versus the more sort of collective housing of what I was calling the narrative with the, uh, with the capital N. Mm-hmm. It, it so, the, you know, the, yeah, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, it didn't have to be a house. It could have been something else. Mm-hmm. This seemed like the easiest way to represent it. Yeah, I think that's the definitely the accessible way in which we can understand the philosophy of psychology that we can definitely find in the works of Hurricane Murakami. And, but I'm wondering this sort of uh, structure of the house um, because it seems to provide this really um, not binary, but at least like the clear division between above ground and underground. And then the, you have a first floor, a second floor, and then different layers of um, uh, subterranean consciousness, if you want to call it. Um, but it seems like when when you uh, read your book about the analysis of this metaphysical realm, it's quite disorienting. Um, <laughs> so you have to give me a map to get out of here. That's that's the that's the <laughs> well, question. Mediterranean <laughs> rabbit hole. Yes, go on. <laughs> exactly. So I mean, it seems like there are several turning points um, in the, in your analysis of you know Murakami's novel, where this binary division of real and real physical metaphysical is is is, is challenged. Uh, you know, for instance, you have description of this tangles question in Ichikyo Hachion. You know, the, the question, am I in the world of the novel? You know, the, the tango asked that question. Um, so perhaps my question is, what are the grounds in which we can draw the distinction between real and imaginary or historical and a fictional uh, events within uh, Murakami's work? Uh, I, I don't think you're going to like the answer to this one. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> if there's an answer, I, I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we yeah. surely enter the rabbit hole here. I, I actually will argue that there is no point at which we can firmly declare that we are in the real or what what we what we're calling here in your question the unreal. But I'm actually going to resist that a little bit because I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of unreal. I, in a sense, it's inevitable for us because we like this binary. And even if we're looking at it in Japanese, we're looking at genjitsu and higenjitsu. And so, we, you know, and he generally means non in these instances. You have hinin for non-human uh, and here higenjitsu. But I, I was thinking, I was thinking about this earlier today because I looked at your question and thought, oh boy. And I realized that a word like hijo ni, you know, hijo sounds more interesting to me because an English translation for that is extraordinary. You know, he's meaning un, uh, unusual, yes, but extraordinary. And so one thing I want to try and get out there right now is the idea that we're not dealing with real and unreal so much as real and extra real. And I guess the message that I'm uh, one of the messages I'm trying to get through in this book is that <clears throat> all things are real, but all things are also grounded in individual perception. And so whether Tengo goes into the world of the novel as he's creating it or is in the world that surrounds him in the physical space, he's still in a real space. And in a sense, we could even extrapolate our own experience here and say that our lives, this is going to sound a little crazy, but our lives are really also narratives that we're constructing line by line which with each day that we live. Uh, what are we if not a narrative, a story 
And what is memory if not a place where we store the lines of that narrative? So in that sense, I don't think I, I'm not I'm not saying it's a bad question. It's a great question. I guess what I'm saying is the question may be a little bit pointless because in uh, uh, don't don't take that the wrong way, please, Takeshi. It's, I don't. No, 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 no. I'm very fascinated. I mean, I, I think this distinction between. Uh, tsune and hijo, mm. um, you know, ordinarily and extraordinarily is actually quite really interesting distinction. So please go ahead. Okay, I, I appreciate yeah. that. And I, no, 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 this is great. Yeah. Where, where, where it takes us is to the idea that um, I suppose any one of us could not only be in a narrative of our own construction, but any one of us theoretically and within the Murakami uh, literary space, we do this we could actually direct the, uh, uh, we could choose the direction of the narrative more than we sometimes believe. And this may be the existentialist in me speaking, uh, but I'm firmly of, of the idea that there, there, there's a difference between basic meaningless existence and meaningful existence. And I'm willing to say that in in a meaningless sense, anything exists objectively, but within a meaningful existence, everything must be subjective. And it's really up to us to take charge of that existence and the direction of that narrative. So when narrative, uh, sorry, when Tango comes out and says, am I in the world of the novel? I see this moment of awakening whereby he could potentially say, if I am, I'm, I'm the one writing it with this girl, Fukaedi. And mm-hmm, right, we yeah. could potentially choose our own path. There's no reason why we have to follow the narrative that's already been laid out for us. And so to me, that's a really important moment that it's hinted throughout the early Murakami stories, but without much success, because it takes the form of a guy just putting on a tough guy attitude with the powers that be. You know, uh, okay, I don't need nothing, but you're not going to push me around, sort of thing. Here we have a clear metaphor for the construction of a life itself and the reality that attends that life and the meaning, I should say, the meaningful reality that attends that life. And and it's all with ourselves as authors of our texts. Mm-hmm. So the character realizing that uh, he's in the world of novel itself is a sort of paradoxical awakening of the truth that he is in the world of novel, something like that. It's a possible, that's one way of reading it. Yeah. I mean, this, this mm-hmm. could well be Tango saying, am I in the world? The next line should be in that instance, am I in the world mm-hmm. of the novel or am I in the world of reality followed by, and is there a difference between the two? Mm-hmm. Right. right. Yeah. So the for, first binary distinction to ask the question is already escaping this uh, narrative that actually, um, or the, or, or the kind of awakening that Murakami is actually describing. That's very, very fascinating. Correct. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it is. Yeah. It's one of, one of the strong points of his text, of all of his mm-hmm. and this, Yeah, this is another thing that I wanted to ask in relation to the image. Um, is this image of um, water or underground water or sometimes like the well. You know, LA Times Review was using this image of literally well. Mm-hmm. But he seems to have this really special, like, usage of this image of this kind of seepage or porosity or some kind of this, you know, ambiguous boundary between um, Tsune and Hijo, even within the novel. Sure. Um, do, do you think he's purposely doing this to um, challenge our conception of what is real and unreal or normal and abnormal? Uh, or he's just creating the world in which that's just not clear uh, mm. to highlight, yeah, highlight our perception of reality or something like that. That's an excellent question. You know, uh, to start with the image of the Edo, the well, uh, and I'm, I'm struggling to remember exactly what it said in that LA Times review about the well, but if I were to comment on the well as the image, this this is a very early image from Murakami. And to my thinking, it really parallels a whole lot of uh, images that follow a similar pattern and have a, a similar structure. I think there's even a chart in Forbidden Worlds about this indicating some kind of long tunnel-like conduit, which is what a well looks like. 
And, you know, I, I started looking at all the instances in which our, our narrator or protagonist uh, travels down some long, thin kind of passageway including a telephone line, which is just another electronic version. And so I, to me, though, the image of the well is particularly useful and poignant because if you think about the way individuals emerge uh, into the world that they live in, we all look like individuals, and we are. We're separate from one another. We, we have our own space. But we are all in some way connected to something that links us all of us together. And that seems to be one of the standard models in, in Murakami's writing. It really starts to come up in Hard Boiled Wonderland, especially, and it bears more fruit in Wind Up Bird Chronicle, this idea that there is this shared space that we could all potentially access. And the well makes a great image for that. It Really, just any kind of a, a, a how do I put this, a, a small body of of water, a distinct body of water, like a pond, if you like. But if you think about it, all ponds and springs may be or should be connected to some uh, some deeper water source that links them all. And so in a sense, by going down into that well, we, we arrive at the bottom of the well, uh, I, I mean, assuming there's water, or the bottom of the, the pond or whatever we're looking at, and we should be able to tap into the source that's feeding all the other ponds and all the other wells as well. <laughs> and so, mm-hmm. it, right. So there's a seepage between different sy- water systems, basically. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. So we are all separate, but we're also all connected in that sense. And it's a very nice mm-hmm. image of intertextuality, if you like. Now, yeah. the second, the second part of your question, whether this, uh, you know, creates a, a Actually, could you repeat the second part of the question? I want to make sure I do it. Yeah, so, you know, what's the purpose of this sort of image in a sense that the, is he trying to create the literally world in which these distinction between real and unreal and, you know, tsune and hijo are, hmm. are kind of liquefied <laughs> and try to highlight the fact that these are really vulnerable distinctions that we use normally in our society? Uh yeah. yeah, so I oh, guess okay. my question is the fun- function of that um, imagery of this network of water. Well, I'm I'm laughing in joy at your use of the word liquefy because that's that it's a beautiful idea, and I think you're quite right. The use of something like water, which is mobile and moves and constantly changes, I uh, you know it goes through this cycle of being absorbed into the air. It forms clouds. It rains down seeps into the ground and then comes back. It's cyclical. It really does kind of give us this idea, not so much of a binary between the the physical and the metaphysical or the real and the extra real, but it gives us the idea of this symbiotic relationship between the two, whereby they're constantly interacting with one another. And yes, I would agree with you that even though the narrators go down these passageways and suddenly find themselves in the other world, really at no point do we know exactly when they've crossed the border. The border is blurred by the path, by, by the journey. And so the, the borders are blurred. And there are times when we're not sure whether the, the character is in the other world or not. One of the best examples I can give you is when, uh, when, Watanabe Toru is traveling to the sanatorium. Is it sanatorium? Is that the right word? Where where Naoko is being kept, and uh, where she's recuperating from her, her her emotional problems. And he he passes, as I recall, he he travels. Uh, I think it's from Kyoto Station by bus through a forest and up to where she's living. And it's in that passageway through the bus uh, through the forest in the bus that he starts to notice things feel different. Uh, it's it's a classic Ichiyuki type situation. You know, one of those things you find in Edo period plays where the characters are traveling from the world of the living to the world of the dead, and usually accompanied by poetry and song and rain and lightning and scary sounds and things. But in his case, it just feels cold. And he's like, what's happening? This is This is uncanny to me. And we find those scenes throughout Murakami, 
but never can we pinpoint exactly when he crosses the threshold. And so I think the worlds really do, in a sense, blur together. And I suspect the borders move. I, I really couldn't tell you why I think that. But, it, you know, every now and then the hero will just suddenly notice that he's in an, another place. Again, Kafka in the shore. Uh, Kafka on the shore, I should say. As Kafka penetrates that deep forest in Shikoku, we have to ask, at what point has he crossed through the gateway that everybody's talking about? It is it when he meets the two soldiers who meet him there? Or is there another point where he crosses another threshold? Where are these thresholds? Is Oshima's cabin in the in those woods part of the other world, or does it exist right at the border? It's really hard to tell where one world ends and the other begins. So, and whether that's a bigger message for us that you know we shouldn't shouldn't trust reality and other things, uh, non realities, I'm not really sure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So maybe I could, you know, rephrase that question um, with, with the two different questions. One is this conception of um, narrative. So the big uh, capitalized narrative, um, you know, so that in a way, Murakami is challenging this pre-established, already made narratives and don't believe in these things as the basis on which we make these judgments. So he's definitely, uh, you know, challenging this. But it's, it seems like once we have this blur, blurry distinction between what is real and unreal. Um, so I, I'm going to give you an example just to uh, give you a concrete question. So for instance, the fallacy of the objective fact, the that there isn't such thing as this already made narrative or th- this you know objective facts that we can all agree on. It's all subjective. Um, so it's all written from the perspective of, of individual wells. But you also mentioned there's a way to recover facts objectively. Um, so this is the quote from your book. Um, so my question is, that, is this like, how do we know that we're moving away from already made pre-established narrative to self-creating narrative of individuals that are um, recovering the objective facts? That is a great question. I, I would probably say first that uh, the, the, the so-called, you know, these so-called ready-made narratives, the overarching narratives, I think in one sense they, we might call them wolves in sheep, sheep's clothing because they are not the narrative with the capital N. They are masquerading as such. And so, uh, and of course we're talking about uh, these 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 sort of monolithic stories that we're given, here is what life means. Just write it down and live by this. And if you can't deal with it, then there's something wrong with you. Now, I would say here that overarching narratives are a part of life. And I'm, I'm not going to come out and say uh, they're, they're not useful because they are. If you think about it, another word for that is culture. We are given certain narratives that we, we are urged either to accept or to critique, but at any rate to hear. And, uh, society tells us that, uh, you know, murdering our parents is wrong. Having sex with our children is wrong. These are things we shouldn't do. And these are part of a larger narrative that says, here's your morality. Here's what is acceptable and not acceptable. All of that, I think, is rather important. Without that, we have chaos and of course, we need to pay attention to those things. But when it comes down to deeper questions of what the individual life means and what value it has, that's where I think we need to start to construct our own our own stories. Now, I will say that the narrative that has the capital N, you know, the big narrative, this is something that does lie accessible down in that sub-basement space. But it's not, a, it's not really a coherent narrative. What it is, is a collection of all narratives all at once in one body. And, and bits and pieces of it separate themselves and inform us as we confront the world all the time. And they allow us to construct our own narratives. And in that sense, we, we construct, I suppose you could say, our own truths and our own realities 
And I think one of the big points of Murakami is that we can easily be fooled by the narratives that claim to be universal. And many of these are things we're taught in school or things we're taught by religion. What we should be taught, I think the the Murakami text says or suggests, what we should be taught is that we can look at these narratives critically and we can measure them against what we feel inside and construct our own reality. Now, as to how this connects with the apprehension of objective fact, that becomes a little trickier for me. And it may be my thinking has changed a little since uh, this book, but I rather doubt it. Um, I suppose I would say, for one thing, that objective fact is probably obtainable, but not meaningfully, if I can put it that way. We can, for instance, if we're telling a story We can tell the who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, Sorry, the how, I should say. The why is secondary, and and the why is trickier. It's the trickiest of all stories to tell, because often the person telling the story doesn't really know the why, even if they're the one involved. And so we can get all of the facts, but the real question is, what does the story mean? And so this is why, uh, for instance, in the chapter on literary journalism, I was I was curious to see how you could take a real world story that has all the facts as we know them available, but turn it into something that the reader can actually reconstruct as a new narrative that works for them and tells them something meaningful about the world outside and the world within. And that's why uh, simply reading standardized uh, stories that are grounded, frankly, often in these overarching social narratives that should be always questioned, if not rejected. I don't say they should be rejected. But if we accept the story that's grounded in those narratives, we actually give up the right to construct our own, uh, our own set of facts and our own set of meanings from those facts. And even... Just looking at the way a, a story in the news is constructed, it's much like history. Uh, a journalist must select what they will write about, what's going to be important, what's going to be emphasized, uh, how the story is going to be written. All of these things are powerfully subjective decisions. and they, they will color the way the story comes across to the reader. The reader often needs, uh, in fact, every reader needs to approach that story as a textual potentiality that will be ultimately reconstructed within their own minds anyway. So that that's where I start getting into trouble with objective fact. Uh, right. It's, it's not um, I, I, we make it subjective. <laughs> mm-hmm. So perhaps I have this question about this subjectivity uh, before the last question I want to ask with relation to Tazak Tsukuru. Because that's a really fascinating story that I wanted to ask you about as well. But the uh, since we talked about this uh, latest book on the um, first person singular, um, sometimes Murakami uses boku and watashi, um, which doesn't really cash into. Um, I don't know how they did the translation of that into English. I don't um, either. <laughs> yeah. So my question is: Do you think he's even challenging us to? rethink what counts as a single individual as well through his novels. Well, is it always about, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm always uncomfortable trying to say what he's trying to do, but I think. Sure. Well, the text. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. If if you take the the general, just, just the collectivity of his writing, the, the overall body of it, I think he's always challenging that question. And, you know, I, I often ask my students, too, why, why, why is he using boku? Why does he switch to ore here? Why is he using watashi? And, and for that matter, why doesn't he use names at all? And we get all sorts of interesting different responses. I, I think the bottom line is, yeah, all of, all of us spend our lives, uh, once again, to come back to Jung, trying to individualize ourselves, to figure out who we really are and to become the person that we are meant to be, to become ourselves. And I really do think that's one of the major central uh, achievements of Murakami's work is each one of these stories involves somebody who's trying to become 
as one of my students said, and I, I'm trying to remember now which one said this, uh, she said, it, they're trying to become the protagonist of their own story. And I thought that was a beautiful phrase, uh, just beautifully said. And I'm very proud of that, mm-hmm. though I can't remember which one. <laughs> we have to find a way we'll to what find the beautiful out. line was said. Yeah. She knows who she is, so whoever you are, way to go. It's, um, <laughs> it was one of my graduate students. And, and I thought, mm-hmm. oh, this makes so much sense. We, we spend our lives trying to figure out who we are, and everybody around us does try very hard to help us. And some of them try to tell us who we should be. And some actually go as far as to tell us who we actually are. But I think for Murakami's heroes, and possibly Murakami himself, the whole point is that it's got to come from inside. He's, he's a very Gnostic writer in some ways. Uh, you know, and, and, and so the self springs up from inside. And, and this, this is not exactly a great revelation. We all know that. And it's, uh, the popular films are all full of this, you know, just be yourself. But it's very hard to know how to do that. So he presents us with 30 or 40 or 50 or 1,000 protagonists who are all trying to do that, to become themselves in some way. And so wh- whether this really affects in a, in a major way which pronoun he chooses to use is, is another question. I think that has I see. But- very much with the kind of character he's trying to portray. Yeah. I mean, that takes me to this uh, question about the uh, pilgrimage in right. Tazakitsukuru. Uh, because we talk about Shikoku and all these Japanese pilgrimage where the distinction between sacred and you know non-sacred is always blurry. So if you go to Shikoku and do the 88 temples, um, you don't really know which part is actually sacred passage and which part is just ordinarily somebody's backyard. Um, <laughs> that's the feeling, you know, the, in, in yeah. Shikoku. But that's the, also the feeling that I get from um, uh, the, the book that you said that you're really interesting is it Um it, it seems like the character is doing precisely that, you know, trying to find out his self-identity and what actually happened to, to himself, like with his relationship with other friends. And, but you describe really interesting that moment where he goes through almost like a religious um, transformation, that he goes into this not eating, physically responding to this inability to cope with what's actually happening in his life. And then he somehow, um, you know, embraces his imperfection and then experience this growth and I wonder that that is really a um, um, different feature uh, from other novels in um, Haruki Murakami's novels in the sense that there's a kind of transformation or conversion of the character. And, you know, it is going back to where he was, you know, so there's not so much change between the beginning and end of the story, but there is a significant um, transformation of the character. You're, you're quite right about that. And, and I, I love mm. it that you've sort of fixated on the, um, on the quasi-sacred nature of this because I, there are a lot of things about Tazaki Tsukuru that are unusual, the novel, I mean, not the character. Uh, one of which is that uh, the starting point, we might even say, of his pilgrimage goes back 16 years to when he is first cast out of his group as a college student and he begins to fast. Uh, or, or starve himself in another context. But you're absolutely right. This is, this is a transformation, and it's actually one, I think, that probably gets a little bit of attention even in Kishidan Chogoroshi, and that, that is the, um, the sense of the symbolic death and rebirth of the character. And, and this, is, this, is a very, this is an age-old uh, mythic, uh, kind of idea, and it's something that attends almost every uh, every mythic structure and mythic system that we have. So that all all classic religions and some of the ancient religions we know very little about do involve a kind of symbolic death followed by a rebirth. And the real trick here, uh, what makes I think uh, this novel so unusual, is that Tazaki Tsukuru undergoes his symbolic death so long ago. But when will his rebirth come about? I mean, if you think about it, 
normally you die uh, symbolically. I mean, baptism is a great example of that. You know, you you symbolically die, you're born a new being, you get a new name, you get a new new set of parents, and so on. And it's part of even uh, everyday ritual today. But but Skuru then goes into this extended period of really almost running away from what he must do. Uh, he and, and I think this is actually kind of significant. There may be a historical allegory here, and, and I'm, uh, I'll leave your listeners to figure out what that might be. But he's gone through a terrible trauma. He's basically symbolically, if not actually, died. He looks in the mirror and says, I could be a dead man. The old Tazaki school is dead. He's been buried in a clearing. And so here I am. But then he basically represses all of it. He puts it all into memory and says, now I'm going to ignore it forever and I'm going to live this new life. But without confronting the trauma that led to the the death and the rebirth, the transfiguration. So are the 16 years he spends after his rebirth, uh, you know, designing railroad stations, are these part of the pilgrimage or are these simply years that he chooses to pretend it didn't happen. And that's where the historical allegory could come in, uh, only to be finally brought to his senses by a wise man figure, which would be Sara, uh, Sarah, his girlfriend, who says to him, I'm not going to go any further with you until you solve this enigma, because you haven't actually completed, in a sense, your rebirth. Because re- rebirth should bring about a, a new perspective on life. I'm not sure Tazaki Tsukuru managed to do that. So that's what begins the new journey. And, and you're absolutely right. It's hard to tell when he leaves profane space and enters sacred space. It seems to be well mixed into one in some ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's really fascinating, the observation that in this work, there's... I wonder if it's 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 a kind of a um, space in the metaphysical world that is not um, typically the same as other spaces that you observe that it's just other side or darkness, but there's there's a kind of um, comforting um, possibility that there's a rebirth and let the you know traumatic past be the past. Well, I think you're right about that. In fact, one of, one of the things that uh, Tazaki Tsukuru shares with something like Norway no Mori, Norwegian Wood is that uh, we don't see the direct intrusion of the metaphysical other world into the narrative itself. It's always lurking at the site, but it's not necessarily, we don't go into it. Uh, Although you could argue that uh, Naoko Sanatorium is on the edge of the other world, and and we see it elsewhere. But Tazaki Tsukuru doesn't really go into the magic forest until, arguably, he gets to Finland and goes to that little village that I pronounce, uh, I mean, Lina, is that what it's called? And um, when he gets there, they, you know, I, I read that passage where he's trying to find his way to uh, his old, his high school friend Kuro's uh, cottage, and he sort of gets lost in the woods, and he's guided by a sort of goblin-like figure uh, who, who growls at him in several languages, one of one or two of which he can't recognize, so you could say that is a passage to the heart of the forest. But again, I tend to look at a story like this as a series of concentric circles. And in that sense, it does resemble the other novels that we see. And I'm looking at this in Campbellian terms, sort of the way Joseph Campbell describes the zone of magnified power. You start at the outer edge and you make your way through the labyrinth and you keep getting deeper until you reach the center. And so... In, in something like Hitsuji Omeguru Boken, you can see that very clearly from Tokyo to Sapporo to, oh gosh, where did he go again? Juni Takicho, and then out into the hills until he passes through the threshold, which is clearly that terrible curve in the mountain. And then the long walk to the very heart of the zone. It's harder to discern in uh, Tazaki Tsukuru, but I think you can see as he moves from Tokyo, which is as real as it gets, if you like, for the physical world. He moves from there thence to Nagoya, which is still urban, but it's a different kind of urban, isn't it? And Nagoya is still in Japan, as I suppose we all know here, 
because uh, it, it's often considered a kind of different cultural zone, especially by people who come from Nagoya. Uh, I, I think Shimizu Yoshinori wrote a whole a whole story about what it's what it's like experience in Nagoya, right? Wasn't that yeah. the, you know when I wrote the Kishimen and 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 Soba or mm-hmm. something like that? Yeah, they they're not identify identify either from the Kanto or Kansai. Yeah. And uh, the cities, you know, never experienced depression because of the, you know, Toyota and the big companies. Exactly. So it's a very different zone. Yeah, it exactly. Is. And, and so it yeah. becomes a kind of other world that's different from other major urban centers in Japan. But and, and so it's to some extent, it's across the threshold into the into the other world, but purely in a symbolic way. And so the further he goes from Tokyo, it seems the closer he gets to the heart of the labyrinth. Yet in this novel, there doesn't seem to be a labyrinth, per se, that we get to play with. It's always on the other side of that mirror that Skuru looks into when he's starved himself and he sees the face of a man he doesn't recognize. That's him in, that's the other world. And if you think about that, you see this in Murakami from time to time. The mirror is the threshold, but sometimes we only get to see the mirror. We only get to see that world through the mirror. I, I think it happened at some point. It, it, in a sense, not through a mirror, but just through looking at somebody. We kind of see that in Kishidan Chogoroshi. We see it in the short story Kagami. I remember seeing it. Uh, I'm blanking on the story now. Oh, it was it was the collection of short stories. So, oh gosh, no, it's not a short story. I'm sorry, I'm losing my mind here. After Dark. It was in After Dark. There was a After Dark. Yeah. You remember when he looks in the mirror yeah. and. After the man moves away from the mirror, his image is still there. Mm. <laughs> and we're thinking, oh, that's right, yeah. We get mm-hmm. chills. Yeah, I remember that image now. Yeah. Yeah. But it, yeah, it seems, uh, yeah, that's another thing that we should probably pay attention uh, when his next novel comes out. I They're can't all, wait to see these it. These devices that are so like the uh, reminiscent of somewhere, like I've seen this somewhere, that's the, always the feeling. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when you read right. his novels. So, yeah. I mean, in a sense, yeah. he's. he's with the new short story collection, uh, First Person Singular, he, he, how do I put it? He seems to be playing with some of these tropes that he's already established. It's just, we're not quite sure where they're going, but I would also say that he's written so many short stories in which you get to the end and you ask yourself, why did he write this? What is he telling me? And you, you, you end up concluding maybe, well, this was just to test out a new style or to probe this or that, but it's not really a story trying to tell a big, uh, excuse me, like, you know, some kind of big, uh, big message. It's not a big message story. It's just a test run. And I'm afraid first person singular may have been a bit too much of the test run. What he's testing is the, mm-hmm. I don't know what he's trying out here. <laughs> so Yeah. So what's gonna, what's the, if, uh, the magic that he's going to work out of this is, is, is the big question. That's what I want um, to do. Everybody does. Right? Yeah. Well, I still have so many questions that I'd like to ask you, uh, oh, but the, uh, unfortunately we have to end this interview. Okay. Uh, but since, since we are approaching the end of the interview, I'd like to ask you about your plans for the future. Um, besides figuring out these uh, test runs what are you know what are you working on right now and what's your future agendas that's a great question too i'm i'm actually working on a kind of follow up to forbidden worlds uh, coincidentally but it's going to be dealing with different contemporary and recent writers who have also used the other world as a significant trope in their work so it'll be looking at some of murakami's contemporaries uh, Kawakami Hiromi, uh, Ogawa Yoko, Kurahashi Yumiko, who's a bit from the past, I guess. And um, uh, some some more recent comers, too, like Shinkai Makoto. And, and just looking at how the other world or the liminal space between, you know, Kochiragawa and Achiragawa, over here and over there, gets used to effect in, in some of these different stories. One of the things I want to play with is why this is becoming such a prominent thing. I'm not going to come out and try and say, well, Murakami started all this, because I don't think he did. I, I even see images of this in some of Abe Kobo's work uh, long before Murakami was a thing. So why is this an issue in modern and especially in contemporary writing today? That's going to be one of the central questions of the of the volume. 
but it's still just kind of, I, I know what I want to do with it. I've got an outline, but getting pen to paper is tricky with all the, all the other work <laughs> that there is to do. So I'm mm-hmm. doing that and I'm working well, on a, a history of uh, literary journalism in Japan that may take me the rest of mm-hmm. my life. <laughs> 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 and you might actually become the part of that journalism. I might have I, I'm that, pretty yeah. sure. My, my yeah. obituary so, will close out the book. <laughs> we have to include that into some of the novels in the future for sure. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Matthew. I mean, I mean, I'm very much looking forward to the outcome of these forthcoming research, and I, I'm, I hope that we will be able to actually discuss again at this uh, this channel. I uh, hope we will I, I'm too. pretty sure. It's, yeah. it's been and, a uh, pleasure chatting with you. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, talking with us about your book and your great insight into the works of Haruki Murakami today. We saw that the well is quite large and we can get lost, but also we can enjoy that um, sense of disorientation and orientation. Well, um, my point was so if, if you get lost in the well, just keep going. You'll come mm-hmm. out somewhere else. <laughs> you come out to the different networks of the water, yes. That's right. Uh, thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, yeah, this was kind of great. And thank you, everyone. Uh, this was our discussion with Matthew Carl Strecker, who is the author of The Forbidden Worlds of Haruki Murakami. See you next time.